Welcome everyone to tonight's Language of the Land, Gardening for Wildlife. Tonight's presentation is being interpreted in Spanish. In a moment, you can click on the world icon at the bottom right of your screen and choose your language. If you're on a phone, click on the three dots and choose your language. Tonight's webinar is being hosted by Sonoma Land Trust. Sonoma Land Trust is a local nonprofit that protects land in Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. We've been doing this work since 1976 and have protected nearly 58,000 acres in our county so far. We accomplish our work through the generosity of our members and contributors. So thanks to all of you out there who are helping us protect beautiful Sonoma County for future generations. As we pursue our mission of conserving land in Sonoma County, we recognize that we stand upon the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge their knowledge, care, and stewardship of this special place across the ages and acknowledge the deep and lasting damage that colonization has inflicted on them. We embrace our responsibility to learn from and protect their cultural and traditional connections to the land. Tonight's presentation is also uh, in sponsorship and cooperation with the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County, which is an all volunteer program that has been extending information and providing technical assistance to home gardeners since 1982. The goal of the Master Gardener Program is to create a healthy environment and community through sustainable landscape practices, one garden at a time. Master Gardeners are trained and certified University of California volunteers who provide unbiased, high-quality, science-based information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscape practices to Sonoma County home gardeners. Volunteers are given extensive science-based training. Our tonight's presenter, Bill Klausing, <clears throat> has been a UC Master Gardener, Sonoma County, since 2011. Although his professional career was in healthcare, He's now retired and has been an avid gardener for many decades. His 2008 move to Sonoma County from the Midwest resulted in a gardener's re-education of sorts. Bill now is an enthusiastic supporter of the use of native plantings in the home garden and their role in supporting habitat. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for presenting tonight. Thank you, Ingrid. Okay, greetings everybody. I hope everybody is surviving this warm day that we had today. I try really hard not to turn on the air conditioning in my house, so I'm really trying to <clears throat> make it through the evening without sweating too much. And I hope that tonight I can uh, maybe give you a little inspiration uh, for your home garden uh, in your home space to uh, plant more uh, native plantings. But as she said in, the, uh, in my introduction, I am not a native to California. I spent the first 17 years of my life on this farm in Ohio, a lot of time in that barn, milking the cows, et cetera. Um, and then I lived uh, in St. Louis for 27 years which is sort of where I got started in being a gardener in a suburban setting. And I got recruited to move to Santa Rosa. And in 2008, um, I moved here to Santa Rosa and I bought a home in suburban Northeast Santa Rosa that looked like this. And as you can see, well, it's certainly water wise, but I'm not sure that it's aesthetically very pleasing. And you can see the back of the garage where you see me standing there and I need a machete to uh, beat back the pampas grass. So I immediately discovered upon arrival in Santa Rosa that I had to adapt to gardening in a Mediterranean climate where we have long dry summers, moist, cool winters with a lot of variance from year to year in our climate. And as somebody who was new to, to Sonoma County, 
I bought my house. I closed in the month of August. And one of the first things I tried to do was dig a hole in the in the dirt. And we all know what that's like in the middle of the summertime when you take a long handled shovel out and try to dig a hole. After I'd lived in Santa Rosa for a few years, I became a master gardener. And um, although our master gardener program has changed over the years, this is our current sustainability wheel as we refer to it. Um, encouraging home gardeners uh, to think about all six of these attributes um, in their home garden, conserving water, protecting and encouraging wildlife, conserving energy, and so on and so forth. And if you're using native plantings, uh, by definition, you are going to meet those requirements. My next aha moment, living in Santa Rosa, I'd started doing some landscaping in my garden, but I had not gotten into native plants at all. But I'd planted clearly some, some new things, trying to redo some of the landscape. Um, and this was my one of my first aha moments, was that this butterfly arrived in my garden. Well, that was new to me. It's a common buckeye butterfly, fitting since I am originally from the state of Ohio. Uh, and one of the things that I always want to make sure that I point out to people is that this guy's going to eat green leaves in your garden. But, but if you get rid of him, you'll never see her. Um, you know, so we have to be concerned about feeding those larvae. And I'm, I I'm getting experience as a master gardener. I'm learning more about native plants. And, you know, we have a lot of things coming at us in the year 2023. Our world is changing. Um, we have climate related changes. Um, we have habitat destruction that we have created as a uh, human civilization. But in our changing world, what changes do we see now in 2023? And what do healthy habitats need? And as a home gardener, what can I do? How can I help? Now you are gonna see pops of, I've added lots of photographs, in all the photographs, I've tried to identify the plant specifically. Uh, most all of these photographs are taken in my garden. Uh, I have about a third of an acre here in uh, Northeast Santa Rosa. Um, a lot of concrete, unfortunately, with a pool, um, but certainly a lot of place to uh, put native plantings. But in our changing world, what's going on around us? We're in the midst of what science uh, is describing as our sixth mass extinction event, particularly in insect and bird populations, dramatic decreases, uh, primarily because of decreased habitat space, primarily caused by human civilization. Uh, we've built factories, we've built roads, we've sprayed chemicals, We've done a lot of things to alter uh, what would have been habitat space that the native Americans, the indigenous peoples would have had uh, in Sonoma County uh, prior to 1800. We also have climate change. I'm not gonna get in too much depth about climate change, but we all know it exists. Uh, we know it's getting warmer. Today's a great example. Um, and we're unsure about what our rainfall is going to be moving forward. World Wildlife Fund um, is a nonprofit organization. They do a living planet report every year. And in 2022, their uh, annual report in the fall identified that wildlife populations worldwide had dropped by 69% in the previous 52 years. 
being fed by interlinked emergencies, climate change and biodiversity loss. Now, if you want, um, I'll talk a fair amount about uh, Dr. Douglas Tallamy tonight. And I, and I believe he spoke uh, for, did a web webinar for the Sonoma Land Trust, if I read my history correctly. This map was available through his Homegrown National Park website, which I will uh, talk a little bit about later as well. The darker shade of green are intact habitat cores. The darker the color, the more habitat space. And you can see in wide areas across the United States, there are no habitat cores remaining, uh, no natural habitat cores. If you blow that same map up and look at Northern California, and you can see Sonoma County, uh, you see the areas that are settled, suburbs, agricultural land. Uh, we do not have a shade of green in those areas. And those areas are very easily identified. But we have a lot of habitat space here in Sonoma County, in our hills, in our mountains, in our woodlands. We all live in an ecosystem. A basic definition of an ecosystem is the complex of living things, their physical environment, and their relationships in a particular unit of space. Your city is sort of a larger ecosystem. Your individual garden is in itself a small ecosystem. Many of the insects that live on your property never leave your property. They live their whole lives, multiple generations, they don't commute, they don't migrate, um, they live where you are if you provide them the space. An ecosystem has living and non-living things. Uh, biotic components are all living things. Abiotic are the other attributes uh, in your home garden space, climate, soil, water, sunlight. And in your garden, you have a lot of um, residents, for lack of a better word. Um, you might have some actual animals, larger mammals, but you have a lot of insects. You've got birds, spiders, pollinators. You might have uh, concrete and rocks. Uh, you certainly are going to have plants, hopefully, in your garden space. The point is that all of these garden lives are interconnected and they are dependent upon each other. People talk a lot about pollinators and clearly they are very important um, both in a supportive habitat perspective as well as commercially uh, um, with uh, with the agriculture industry um, that we have here in California. You know, the bees and the butterflies, they're sort of the sexy pollinators. You hear most about them, but you have to remember that there are myriads of other insects that should be living in your garden, quite frankly, if it's a healthy habitat space. I took this photograph this spring, this is a meadow foam, a spring wildflower. And I, I only took the picture because I noticed that a bunch of the um, petals were being eaten. And it wasn't until I downloaded the photograph and I looked at it more carefully. If you see this little interesting looking creature um, to the left of the red arrow, I have no idea who he is, what he is. Is that an adult? Is that a larvae? Uh, my degree is not in entomology. I do not know who he is, and I, but I certainly have never seen him before in my garden. And these are the things that you will find as you, uh, in my experience, put more native plantings in your garden space because they will all support insects of all varieties. 
This is a photograph I took a few years ago. I was doing a library talk and I just wanted a picture. It was in January of my first manzanita blooming. And until I blew up the photograph, I noticed the egg sacs on the manzanita leaf. These are the things um, that I am encouraging people to try to create space in their home garden. More insects, more insects, more butterflies. Now, I'm going to try to play this video, see if this works. This is the insect of the year in the state of California, the white-lined sphinx moth, commonly called the hummingbird moth. You probably, many of you in the audience might have seen this in your garden. Um, I've seen many of them in my garden this year already, particularly at dusk. But if you look up at 12 o'clock, uh, this video was taken at... It was almost dark outside, so I really had to artificially lighten it up. You see that little moth? Looks like a hummingbird. He's visiting uh, my California fuchsia, which is one of the plants that a hummingbird will feed on. And lo and behold, there's a hummingbird sitting at the top, <laughs> sitting at the top of that uh, shepherd's hook, watching that sphinx moth. But hopefully, maybe as some of you might have seen that in your garden this summer. Now, I'm going to bore you with a little bit of basic biology. And that is green plants are the only thing on the surface of the earth that can take sunlight and carbon dioxide and turn it into sugar and oxygen. It's this photosynthesis that is the bedrock of life on the planet. And those green plants in your garden, in a woodland, those green plants supply the food for the first level insect herbivores. And I can't stress this strongly enough, insects belong on plants. I mean, that is the relationship that Mother Nature intended. Now, can insects get out of control on plants? Yes, indeed, that can be a problem. Um, but the thought that you are going to have a, a, a healthy home garden with no insects is uh, uh, unimaginable to me, personally. But you, you move up the food chain. The first level insect herbivores are then, um, you know, eaten, providing food for larger insects, beneficial insects, and you move up the food chain. Um, second trophic level, third trophic level, until you get all the way to the, to the top of the food chain, um, which are mammals. And this is a visual representation of that, of everything that's going on in, in an ecosystem, in your garden at home. You have the producers, which are the green plants. Insects feed on the green plants. Larger things, birds, et cetera, feed on the insects. Now, what are healthy habitat space needs? What are the things that you can do in your home garden? Well, the biggest thing is that you can plant native green plants. Those native green plants are the food for your first level consumers. A good habitat space also needs shelter for those insects to hide from predators, to reproduce. Um, all of these things that I have listed here, bunch grasses, snags, old logs, fallen leaves are all shelter that benefit um, your insect and wildlife populations. All creatures, all small creatures in your garden require water daily. Um, I'm not talking about turning on your irrigation daily. I'm talking about some a water source. In my garden, uh, I do, I have bird bath style uh, in both the front and the backyard. 
um, that clearly birds use, but other insects use uh, as their water source. Because even, even your tiny little bumblebee needs water each day. A healthy habitat space needs a place to raise young. All the wildlife need to raise their young. And with insects, it's this attribute that is frequently overlooked. That is the nexus of the relationship between native plants and the native insects uh, that live in your ecosystem. And of course, we want to avoid diseases, invaders, invasives, um, diseases. Um, if, if we were only planting native plants in Sonoma County, we would not have sudden oak death, which came in on an import from overseas. The true native plants that I'm going to talk about tonight, and I'm going to provide you lists and resources, um, those true native plants are best suited to your local soils. They've had centuries to adapt to living in Sonoma County. Um, we all know that our climate uh, has had many wild swings through the centuries, drought, wet, repeat as necessary. And those true native plants are going to be those that are most attractive to your native wildlife. I snagged this from a, a Department of Agriculture forest publication um, that listed the advantages of using native plant materials. And if you think back to that um, six-pointed uh, sustainability wheel that I showed a little while ago, you will see that many of these points are very similar. Those native plant materials are unlikely to be invasive or overly competitive with other native plants. They provide food sources in the form of nectar, seeds, leaves, pollen for native butterflies, insects, birds, and other animals. Those native plants reduce energy consumption and pollution. They reduce the need for pesticides. They protect at-risk species, and by definition, they encourage um, biodiversity in your garden space. I do have to give a shout out to this Western spice bush in the corner of it. This is one of my favorite little Sonoma County native plant finds in the years that I have lived here. Um, this is a very, it, it's a deciduous shrub with really glossy green leaves, requires a little more water than low, low water, um, and likes a little shade, but it is so beautiful when it blooms in the springtime. Now, I'll give you a link later on to um, Calscape, which is a website that is supported by the California Native Plant Society. And this is direct verbiage from their planting guide. And I can't stress this enough uh, to think about this, that non-native plants can seldom be the host for native insects for, uh, because few of those insects can get past the chemical and structural defenses of those non-native plants. They are used to the native plants with which they co-evolved. Uh, you know, the best example of this and certainly the most well-known is the relationship uh, between monarch butterflies and milkweed. And everyone's being encouraged to put milkweed in your garden. I have some in my garden. Uh, and those larvae of the caterpillars in that life cycle of the monarch butterfly, those are the only insects that will eat milkweed because they are the only ones who can get past that milky, nasty um, goo that is a, that you know if you cut open a milkweed, you find. Now, 
I just just did just want to give a quick little run through of some non-native invasives and how they can affect you because we have a lot of this here in Sonoma County. Um, my property, when I bought it, uh, you saw from the photographs, I was inundated with pampas grass. There was also a lot of bamboo. I had the English ivy. I've got the Armenian blackberries, uh, privet, privet, a lot of privet. Um, but the unfortunate thing is that those non-natives have less insect activity. Um, so that has an effect on your uh, habitat friendliness of your uh, home garden. Clearly there are other things that are non-productive. Uh, uh, traditional lawns, um, river rock, weed barrier cloths, artificial turf. I included these couple of slides. I just, this is the project that um, the California Native Plant Society has undertaken out in Bodega, where they are trying to remove um, the ice plant that you see all up and down um, the Sonoma coast. Now, the ice plant was planted with good intention to try to hold the soil, to decrease erosion. I mean, those are good things. The thing that we didn't realize when they planted the ice plant is that it would swallow every other living green creature within sight. You can see this big pile of uh, pulled up, dying, drying ice plant that volunteers have removed. They're doing this project both at Bodega Head and in uh, on the Duran Beach side of Bodega. I hear pampas grass might be one of the new projects that they undertake on the coast. But just in one year of removing that ice plant, look at how this resilient lands native landscape has emerged. I can identify five native species on this hillside that are growing that would have been swallowed up last year. These seed banks are in the native soil, are, in, are already there, if you just free them. Uh, I took this photograph right next to the parking lot at Bodega Head, and I know that this side of the parking lot was swallowed uh, by ice plant one year ago. And in its place, we have these two native plants thriving um, once the ice plant is removed. This is so much better for your pollinator populations, for the for the habitat support. I took this photograph the very first summer that I lived in Santa Rosa, not knowing uh, the importance of what I was even taking a picture of. Uh, it, we've got Areogonum latifolium, um, the, the seaside buckwheat. You've got the Dudleya. This is the famous Dudleya that the poachers came to try to steal um, from the California coast. And you can see it's trying to be swallowed by the ice plant around it. Um, I just enjoyed the, the bloomage and not realizing how foundational that would be to my experience here in Sonoma County. This is a representation of what would be a balanced ecosystem. And in that balanced ecosystem, the primary producers, those are the green plants, Primary consumers are the insects. Primary producers are the green plants. And in a balanced natural ecosystem, the majority of those plants, the primary producers, are going to be native if they haven't been altered by humans um, uh, or other, you know, birds transplant seeds over distance. You know, you're not going to have 100% native plants in any sort of an ecosystem. But what happens is, is that most of our, if you would look at uh, suburban homeowners in Santa Rosa, probably at least three quarters of their plants are non-native uh, in their home garden, if not more. And what happens is if you shrink those green plants, it modifies what can live there less insects, less birds, right up the food chain. And it's those things uh, 
that I try to get people to think about when they're deciding what to plant in their garden at home. Now, we do have diminishing resources. We've got water issues. Uh, we know that's probably not going anywhere in the near term. Um, we have more excess heat days today. Today is close to one. I think that the official um, University of California threshold for an excessive heat day is 98 degrees. Um, and we've had less of them this summer than the previous summer, which is good from my perspective. Um, but we need to improve the efficiency uh, of our habitats. And the way to do that is to plant more natives. So how can the home gardener support habitats? Well, you provide sustenance to those habitat residents, native green plants. Um, do this with being water aware. Create conditions that habitats need to survive. Provide that food, shelter, water that everybody needs. Um, plant smart. I have some plant smart slides to follow shortly. Be firewise and be nature aware for garden maintenance. I'll, I'll brush on that uh, concept a little bit too. Uh, this is a poster from an organization called Healthy Yards. It's another nonprofit. Um, and one of the big movements now is leave the leaves. So in the fall, you don't do a very sort of uh, a fastidious cleanup in your garden. Try to leave some of the leaf duff that is available. You don't want to leave that next to the house. We want to be fire smart. Um, but if you can have areas away from your home um, that you can allow nature uh, to do its cycle would be great. Planting smart, uh, these are sort of my rules for planting smart. Natives, native plants should become foundational. And you need to plant in layers. Um, you know, uh, you could describe the, this list as really short, short, medium, tall, uh, because you want all of these things in your garden space if you have the opportunity. Now, of course, many of us have relatively small lots. Uh, we're limited in the size of things that we can put in the garden, uh, but making wise choices, and I'm hope hopefully going to give you uh, resources so that you can find what would work best in your home garden space. Some evergreens are very helpful. Um, evergreens are important for shelter, um, for insects, wildlife, and get your neighbors involved, get your friends involved, spread that word. If you wanna plant smart, plant in hydrozones. Um, put your really dry water plants, uh, low water use plants together. If you have a handful of plants that require more water, put them on a similar drip line so that you can uh, um, be most efficient in, in your watering. Uh, plant in swaths and drifts. Use multiple plants of the same species. Now, that is really good for insect and for insect mobility. Uh, what I have found myself sometimes doing is I might only buy one plant this year, put it in a location. If that works, then maybe next year I'll put some additional plants in that same space. You need some density of native plants to really have an effect in your home garden. Um, if you only were going to plant a dozen native plants, I would suggest that they should all be in a sort of one area of your garden as opposed to scattered about, you know, scattered across a quarter of an acre or uh, whatever size lot you might have. And keep an eye for the bloom calendar. Now, this is a really important concept for pollinators and um, trying to keep food, pollen, and nectar available for pollinators. I know that Ingrid put this document um, in your chat box so that you can download it. It's a two-page number. These are all native plants to Sonoma County. They go from wildflowers to trees. There's quite a variety here. 
Um, but it talks about when they bloom and when on the when on the physical calendar um, they will uh, create pollen and nectar uh, for pollinators. And so you want to try to get things to bloom. Uh, uh, um, and you can see that, you know, fall and winter can be more challenging. Um, this, I've got a few slides here that will just take you on a quick jaunt um, through the calendar year at my house. We start with, in my garden, um, spring wildflowers. I've got a couple of Clarkias, um, uh, meadow foam. These are all self-seeding wildflowers. Once you get them established, if they're in a good location, they will regenerate every year. As spring moves along, the California poppies are blooming. Uh, you see this uh, silver bush lupin, which is a woody perennial lupin. Spring turns into summer. These are native hookahs. Uh, these are um, on my on that bloom calendar handout that I just that I shared with everyone. Here we move into summer. Uh, I love the California buckwheats, the areogonums. I have a lot of them in my garden. They also will do some self-seeding. And coyote mint, uh, uh, these are both uh, blooming. Uh, the ki My coyote mint is done now, uh, but it bloomed in July, June and July. Um, California buckwheats are still blooming. Uh, Madia elegans. This was the plant that I didn't even know that I really wanted. And now I have like a whole little meadow of this annual, uh, it's really an annual herb. It's an interesting pollinator plant in that it certainly attracts lots of uh, bees, uh, particularly native bees. And uh, it's also a, the surface of the plant is sticky. So there's a whole sort of undercurrent of insect activity going on. Another Ariogonum, this is a yellow, Ella Nelson's yellow, which is a really buttery yellow when it first blooms and then it turns russet um, as summer moves on. This is relatively new in my garden, um, woolly sunflower, Ariophyllum. There's a couple of different species that you can probably find at native plant nurseries. Uh, really has performed well in the two years it's been in my garden. I'm going to be adding uh, more as I see fit. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about trees and native trees in particular. Um, Sonoma County Master Gardeners, uh, each year, the organization will choose a topic. And this year, it was the year of the tree, which is uh, fitting uh, for this little section of my talk, why are trees so important to habitats and biodiversity and their importance in your home garden space? The increase in leaf surface area is immense in a tree. So you get more photosynthesis, more carbon sequestration. A single tree, particularly a native tree, can be host to many, many insect species. I'd like to refer to native trees as insect hotels. You don't need to buy those little insect boxes that they will try to sell you um, at the uh, nursery to put in your garden. Just put the plants that the insects want to live in and you'll be much better off. Uh, an important thing about trees, and I'm going to expand that to include larger shrubs, is that that shade that they can create in your garden is very important. Um, uh, and that shade will cool the soil. It covers the soil in the same concept that uh, mulch will. Um, so they, it's an important concept of trees and larger shrubs in your garden space. And all of this will make your the heat level in your garden lower. We all know that if you go under that certain shade tree, 
in the backyard that it's 10 degrees cooler if you go underneath the shade tree. Now, scattered trees can support just as much biodiversity as habitat patches. And so the single selection or the selection of a couple of small trees in your garden can have an outsized influence um, in habitat support. The National Wildlife Federation, which is a website that I do like, um, they do also have recommendations for native plants in various areas across the United States um, for habitat support. These four genus, genera, um, are probably most impactful for habitat support. Uh, we have all of these here in Sonoma County, um, although the Quercus and the Prunus are the only low water users. Um, the Populus, the, the Cottonwoods, the Cottonwood family, and the Willow family are all moderate water use. You'll find those in riparian areas. Um, I have a seasonal creek that runs behind my house and I cannot keep the willow from crawling into my garden because it wants to live there. And why focus on native trees as opposed to non-native trees? There are certainly non-native trees that can be helpful uh, in your home garden. But these three things, biodiversity, sustainability, and habitat support are the reasons that we focus on um, native trees. Now there is a second handout that I was going to make available a few years ago when somebody twisted my arm and got me to put together a, a, a library seminar on uh, native trees of the North Bay. I created this little spreadsheet. It includes not only trees, but many larger shrubs. Uh, because if you have a small lot, if you live in Santa Rosa and uh, you have a lot that's only 5,000 square feet, as much as I would like to tell you to plant a native oak tree, that's probably not realistic. Um, in 2122, I was a member of this project. You can link to this list on the um, UC Master Gardener uh, website, which I'll give you a link to at the end. Um, this was a project that we did with the city of Santa Rosa. These are all very low water trees and large shrubs um, that the city wanted to have uh, uh, a list of um, as they try to be more water wise in their recommendations. And I'm just going to show you a few slides of some of my favorite um, California native trees. This is the Western red bud. I have a small one in my garden. Um, this is the champion Western Redbud, which is in the JC neighborhood here in Santa Rosa. And um, it's much taller than uh, it's supposed to be, <laughs> but it's an amazing uh, specimen. Uh, we have the California Buckeye. Uh, um, mine in, I have a small one in my garden. It finally sort of looks like a small tree now, and it is blooming. Um, uh, it's one of my favorite California natives. Manzanitas, I love manzanitas. I'm not sure that I had an appreciation of them when I first moved to uh, Sonoma County, um, but I find them quite charming. And there are, and there is quite a variety of varietals, species, crossbred species, um, so that you can extend the bloom time. Um, some manzanitas will bloom as early as January. Uh, late ones won't bloom until um, March or April. Coast live oak, the um, Quercus agrifolia is probably the most common native tree that you'll see um, in and around Sonoma County. Uh, I don't have any on my property, but I have a huge forest right behind me. The blue oak is a tree that I'm particularly fond of. Uh, for a few reasons, um, I have a, I planted one, I had to take down an old valley oak on the corner of my property a few years ago, and I've replaced it with a blue oak. And um, the blue oak is slow growing. It will be a century before it would get too large for the garden space. Um, and it is also sudden oak death resistant. 
So uh, that's a really good fit um, for a suburban garden. And then we get to the to the um, shrubs, the larger shrubs, toyon. Um, these two little toyon are in my garden um, here at my house, and you can see in the winter time they create berries, food for birds. Um, toyon is also evergreen, and even though it's evergreen. It creates a great leaf duff underneath once they are established because there's always a few old leaves dropping away. Um, manzanitas are the same way because they only keep their leaves for a couple of years. So if you have a 10 year old manzanita, you could have six years worth of uh, dropped leaves underneath. Uh, coffee berry, another larger shrub um, that I really love, also creates, uh, generates. Uh, pollen in the springtime, spring and summer for pollinators, and then berries for birds and other wildlife in the fall. Uh, ribes, sanguineum, uh, the pink flowering currant, you'll find this in a lot of nurseries. Uh, same concept, blooms early in the spring, good pollinator plant. Again, fruit for uh, berries for birds and other wildlife in, in the fall and in the winter. Now. Now we're getting to a, 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 a little bit of uh, some uh, controversial area. This is a, a, a black elderberry that's in my garden and it's a fancy uh, 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 black elderberry. So the leaf is a different color. The blooms are normal. The pollinators that come to it are normal. It makes black elderberries fruit as it's supposed to. So I'm more concerned about the function and the functionality of a plant in my garden space as opposed to whose genetic background uh, you come from. Uh, what confuses uh, elderberries is there are black elderberries that are European in uh, genetic background, and there are California black elderberries. Um, there is also a subspecies, which now we are calling Sambucus mexicana, that's the blue elderberry, um, that is unique, actually, uh, is fairly unique to California. But we have all of these things. You've got members of the same genus, different plants, same genus, and you have nativars, which are um, horticulture industry cultivars that may have native plant parentage. And there are native plant purists who will say by definition, well, that's not a native plant if you plant a nativar. Uh, again, I go back to my question is, how does it function in your landscape? Does it do what you want it to do to support wildlife? And uh, But a consideration for these um, hort horticulture industry um, creations is that when you change a leaf or bloom color from its original native plant, you're likely to have a diminished impact on habitat support. Um, you know, not all insects can see color, but if it's the wrong bloom and it's an insect that sees color, it might discourage them. Or if the leaf is a wrong is the wrong color, um, all things to just consider. Uh, also, I had in that slide earlier, I talked a little. I, I had suggested planting bunch grasses. Um, they're in, important for a couple of reasons. Number one is shelter. Um, they are major uh, shelter for wildlife. And native bunch grasses also generally have pen penetrating roots, which are really helpful in the wintertime during our winter season, so that we try to return some of that uh, rainfall back to the water table. Deer grass gets very large, but there are plenty of smaller other opportunities for bunch grasses. This eyebrow grass um, is lovely. I just started this in my garden this year. Um, there are also native sedges, native rushes, 
Um, there's even uh, there's there are native California fescues um, that you can find that are bunch grasses, uh, which is what existed on the hills of California um, before cattle ranchers showed up and uh, brought invasive grasses to our hillsides. Now I talked a little bit about Doug Tallamy, and this is his uh, this was his first book. I discovered this um, sort of after my own aha moments of what I was doing in my garden. This was published in 2008. Um, this is his website. He's trying to encourage people to have homegrown national parks in their home garden. But in this original uh, text in 2008, um, he was already, uh, Dr. Tallamy was saying, gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. And it's on those th thoughts that I want people to think about um, some other things for your consideration. You know, the home garden can be both socially and ecologically beneficial. These are natives in my garden. Um, but certainly quite beautiful. Uh, and I think a lot of people are concerned about planting natives and will it be aesthetically pleasing in their garden space? And uh, I have to say to them, absolutely. Um, but you're gonna have to experiment on what you like and what you don't like and what works and what doesn't work. Your garden is gonna be a living landscape. Uh, there will be a plant death um, you're going to have to replace plants that don't survive, um, but stay the course. Keep working at it. You find something that you find one plant that does really well. We'll buy a couple more of them the next year and put and make that will that will be a multiplier um, for the in for the insect support that you're providing in, in your uh, habitat space. Habitat gardens can serve as a refuge for creatures that struggle for survival. When you're shopping for um, native plants, you may come across uh, um, plants such as this, uh, plants with local ecotypes. Um, uh, um, a native yarrow, Achillea, millifolium, that's called Sonoma Coast because that's where the plant originated. Um, the coyote mint, Monardella, there's the Russian river version. Um, there is an Arctostaphylus manzanita that's from Hood Mountain. Um, so you know those are appropriate um, for planting locally because that's where um, mother nature got them started. Even the Smithsonian Institute um, in 2019 made a uh, position paper and formally said that home gardeners should prioritize native plants to support songbird populations uh, because they have been so decimated in recent years. And, you know, those birds in my garden, uh, I, I, that's been sort of one of my telltale signs of how my garden space, how my habitat space has evolved from year to year. And a couple of years ago, I discovered this uh, app. It's called Merlin Bird ID. It exists for iPhones and Androids. Probably a lot of you might already have it on your phone. But I have the flashback to when I bought my property here in Santa Rosa in 2008. And I can tell you that I didn't hear no birds. I didn't see any insects. But on the 26th of June last summer, I did a five minute recording sitting on my front porch and identified all of these species of birds singing, which from my perspective, um, is uh, a great feat for my little suburban, what was a sterile uh, 
piece of property in 2008. Now, I need to add to that, I do. Ha I had two new species of birds this year in 23 um, move in, build a nest, have a clutch of uh, little ones, raise them, and uh, move on. One of which is a, a chestnut-backed chickadee, which was a beautiful bird, which I had not seen before um, until I found them feeding babies next to the house and you see this photograph on the and is my ravens that moved in in the springtime and built a nest at the top of the pine tree in the back corner of my property i watched these two ravens mom and dad guard the nest sit over the nest and eventually the two fledglings leave the nest and learn how to fly, which took several weeks. It was several weeks of entertainment. Um, the only bad thing is, you know, ravens is probably as much wildlife as I really want in my garden because they are really uh, beastly to uh, many songbirds. So, but the interesting thing is, is that once the once those babies were gone, they're gone. And I have not seen them since, uh, I think that was about the middle of June when they disappeared. An additional handout, which I think Ingrid was going to share with everybody on the post um, webinar email are these resources for native plants. Everything from um, a few textbooks that I think are really helpful um, to a lot of websites. I'm going to mention a couple of these. Calscape.org. Um, that is a searchable, detailed uh, website created by the California Native Plant Society. You can search if you're looking for native shrubs at your street address, you can input that information um, to the Calscape website. Um, Dr. Talamy's inspired website, Homegrown National Park. We, you have our UC Master Gardener Program website um, at ucanr.edu. Um, I also will point you toward Cal Adapt which is UC's platform for climate change information. So if you are interested in um, trying to stay up to date on uh, information coming forward related to climate change, um, you can find that there as well. Um, and I've listed four native plant uh, retail spots, um, two here locally and two in Richmond. Um, you certainly can find native plants elsewhere, um, but uh, I have not yet been to the watershed nursery in Richmond. It's relatively new. And of course there's our Cal Flora nursery in Fulton, um, which I certainly am a, a regular visitor to. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. I know I had a lot to compete with. We've got the, uh, We've got the uh, big blue moon this evening to look for, and uh, and you all came to listen to me instead of going to see Beyonce uh, in Santa Clara. So I find that uh, reassuring. Ingrid, I'm going to leave this to you now. Questions? All right, great. Thank you so much, Bill, for your presentation. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to follow up the presentation with a Q&A session. Uh, but before we um, get started on that, just a few words for you. Uh, one is uh, please uh, keep engaged with Sonoma Land Trust by following our various social media accounts or visiting our website. You can also view this and past presentations on Sonoma Land Trust's YouTube channel. 
and keep an eye out for our monthly language of the land webinars and in-person outings at sonomalandtrust.org slash outings. You can learn more about the Sonoma County Master Gardener Program and find answers to your gardening questions by visiting their website, sonomamg.ucanr.edu, or by visiting one of their demonstration gardens, which are listed on their website. You can also get answers to your gardening problems by contacting the help desk by email, phone, or making an in-person visit and we will include that information in our follow-up email. Right now, until September 15th, you also have the opportunity to apply to become a Master Gardener volunteer. The new class is offered every two years and starts in January of 2024. So for more information and an application, please visit their website. Sonoma Land Trust is a nonprofit organization. This means we rely on donations from individuals, businesses, and foundations to make our work possible. If you like what you heard today, please consider donating. Your gift helps support land protection and preservation in Sonoma County. To make a donation online to Sonoma Land Trust, visit sonomalandtrust.org and click the donate button. Thank you so much for your support. In these uncertain times, we appreciate everyone who is supporting our work. Now, if you would like to submit questions uh, to ask Bill, we encourage you to please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I've got a number of questions that the audience has been submitting, so we're going to get through as many of them as we can uh, until we reach 8.30. So, uh, Bill, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and launch into the questions. I am, certainly, certainly. Um, I'm going to keep my share on in case I need to go to a slide or some sort of reference for people okay, answering the question. Good. All right. So uh, we have a question from someone who says they have done perhaps too good a job of creating a habitat. A family of six foxes has taken residence in their gardens. They've eaten all the cherries and plums and are currently working their way through the grapes. So they're asking, how do we balance welcoming wildlife and enjoying the fruits of our gardening labor, so to speak? Well, I think that's a very that's a very challenging question, quite frankly, um, uh, because I too have issues with um uh, uh you know wildlife um you know they got a fair number of peaches they got some table grapes um from my garden um when my fig tree is ripe they'll get some figs um and foxes i think can be a particular problem i, I certainly can't speak to foxes specifically um i know that there are foxes in my neighborhood i mean i've seen them drinking out of my pool um, but they have not been a problem for me. Um, I would suggest that uh, you try to have a conversation with um, one of the animal agencies um, to maybe give you some advice. I, I don't know what you can do to discourage foxes specifically. All right, thank you. Uh, so we have another person who says, uh, can you suggest some plants that will grow in very poor soil? Um, they said they rent their home and there are seven big raised beds with a uh, billion old root systems in them. They can't afford to empty the beds and bring in new soil. So they were thinking about spreading wildflower seed to bring in butterflies and bees. They're wondering if this would work or what about sunflowers? And um, they said it's a very hot space in the summer. It's in complete sun. Yes, and the, you know that's, Full direct hot summer sun can be a challenge. Um, the other thing, um, and I didn't really talk about this too much um, in the body of my presentation, is that um, uh, using California natives um, as a plant source um, does not require your soil to be juiced up, so to speak. Um, you know, you don't need amendments. In fact, many native plants 
those soil amendments, that compost and the other stuff that people want you to add to your soil to make your garden soil more garden-like, those are necessary if you're growing food, if you're doing food gardening or fruit trees. If you are only doing landscape plants, you do not need fancy soil. It can be that um, uh, what people don't like, that hard clay um, that many people have here in Sonoma County. There are plenty of native plants that you can put right in that hard clay and they will do fine. Now, the thing is, is you need to plant them right time, right place. Um, and I would suggest that that planting happen in the fall. Wildflowers are, are good for that uh, um, application. Um, California poppies will do great in, in those raised beds. Um, many of the spring wildflowers would do well. Um, tarweed, that Madia elegans would do well in that space. My other consider my other concern is about the old roots um, that the um, person described um, in those raised beds. I suspect those might be coming from a neighboring tree or a large shrub. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you. If if anybody's had the experience of having something planted in an old half wine barrel and sticking it on the ground in Sonoma County. And if it's close to a tree, that tree is going to go up in that wine barrel in a minute. <laughs> nice. And then you can't move the wine barrel because it's rooted. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we have um, another person who is uh, in Sebastopol and they tried planting native plants, but the deer ate them. So they're asking if you have any suggestions aside from fencing of what might discourage the deer from eating the native plants. You know, and I, 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 I find that really sort of curious, only in the sense that um, my garden at home, I have a back that is fenced that, you know, I can keep the deer out of. Um, but I live... Uh, in a wooded riparian sort of area. Um, I mean, I have deer in my garden regularly. Um, I think it was last Sunday I went outside and there was a big buck sitting in the garden in the shade, just chewing his cud, um, uh, uh, completely not bothered that he was only six feet from my house. Um I've not had problems with my natives being eaten by deer in the front. Um, there are There is only one particular um, shrub I'm having trouble getting established. And that is, um, oh, and it escapes me, um, mock orange. And um, that the deer keep eating. Um, I've also discovered, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure that I have any great answers for that. I, I, that's, that's just not been my experience and I have a lot of deer. All right. Well, on a similar note, we have someone asking about if California natives stand up well or survive the wrath of gophers. <laughs> well, it, if, if, if you live in one of those gopher prone, um, areas, you're going to suffer probably the same thing with native plants that you do with non-native plants. Um, although I have to say, uh, non-native plants probably get a little more water and that might be even a little, seem a little more attractive to gophers. Uh, I have the good fortune, knock on wood, um, of living in a very rocky area at the bottom of Fountain Grove. Um, where you cannot dig a hole in my garden without a pickaxe. And um, so the gophers uh, uh, simply leave me alone, which I'm very grateful of. I've lived in Sonoma County for 15 years. I've still not seen a live gopher. And I know some people will like want to hit me, but that's the truth. <laughs> All right. Um. 
Moving into uh, native plants and edible plants. <clears throat> Someone is asking, how do you balance <clears throat> native planting in the same space as edible and often non-native filled gardens? Uh, would there need to be increased insect management on the edible plants? Um, I, I, I really appreciate that question. Um, and I can only, uh, I'm going to answer this from my own experience um, uh, here in Sonoma County, in that I was not a very big food gardener when I moved to Sonoma County. Um, you know, I was mostly a landscape gardener. Uh, you know, um, in the Midwest, I grew, you know, hostas and hydrangeas and lilies and, you know, all of those sorts of things. And um, I moved here, I started putting pollinator plants in, then I started putting in natives. Then I started growing more vegetables. Um, I have a very good friend who lives uh, Bennett Valley, um, sort of backed up to Annadel um, State Park. Uh, and he moved to Santa Rosa shortly after I did, and he and his family, and he did the opposite. He started, by wanting to plant every vegetable known to mankind in raised beds in his garden. And he suffered so many frustrations with the overwhelming number of insects and bad things, you know, eating his blueberries, eating his raspberries, eating his tomatoes and so on and so forth. And you know, I had approached my garden space in the opposite direction that I started with natives and then added food gardening later. And the thing that I found interesting is that I have never, with my limited food production, I've never had an insect problem. Because I think if you have the right habitat of native space and native creatures and you have enough birds to eat those caterpillars that are eating your tomato plants, it will all work out in the long run. Oh, well, that's a really, really interesting point and idea there. Well, I, I, and I, I, I even went so far as that I, I one of my very first uh, uh, master gardener presentations that I did. Um, uh, the, the last name of this gentleman's name is Brant, and I call it Brant's corollary. <laughs> It rem you know, it gave me a flashback to high school geometry, I think. <laughs> and um, I just thought it was a really interesting perspective because he had all of these problems with these insects on his vegetables that I did not have at my house where I had a several year lead head start on using native plantings in my garden. And he is now adding native plantings in his garden. Um, so I'm curious to see how that happens over time. Right. Great. All right. So um, moving into <clears throat> some of our uh, present day challenges uh, regarding climate, uh, we have one person asking, given, given the warming climate, what do you think about also planting natives from Southern California or Mexico in terms of water conservation and plant longevity? I think those are really interesting um, considerations. Um, and actually, if you go, um, if you go to um, the our Master Gardener website and you look at that Climate Forward Tree project that we did with the city of Santa Rosa, you will find a, several trees on that list that would not have been considered native to Sonoma County, but are native to warmer ends of California. And they made that list, um, that climate forward tree list that we did for the city of Santa Rosa, just in that vein, that uh, the, the official climate projections for Santa Rosa are um, uh, less predictable rainfall and warmer temperatures. And um, so as part of that project, uh, we tried to identify, given the data that we could glean 
from the university about what the climate might be like in Santa Rosa in 40 years and what and where in California does that climate exist now and as we went through that exercise we wound up identifying Paso Robles as a possible um what Santa Rosa might be like in 30 40 years wow it's really hot there <laughs> well and, and with less rainfall now the thing is is that you know the 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 the, the climate studies actually do not show our average rainfall in Sonoma County decreasing over time. In fact, they think the average might go up over time. But what we will more likely have are these periods of three, four years of extreme drought followed by some really wet years so that the average rainfall does not change much but the feel, uh, you know, what you feel living in that environment will feel different. Mm -hmm. Right. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, we also have someone asking about how do we balance planting native plants and trees uh, with wildfire risk reduction? Well, and I, I mean, I tried to touch a little bit on that um, in my presentation. But you know you want to follow um, the uh, the firewise uh, constructs um, that Cal Fire provides. You know you want you want to try to keep a, 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 a clean zone um, that goes five feet out from your house, um, and, and you know as you move away from your structure, then um, your plantings can be taller and larger. Um, and so that's how I would um, uh, 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 give a primary focus on that. Um, and the other thing, too, is I talked about trying to leave the leaves and, and leave that leaf duff um, for um, wildlife, for habitat residents. And um, but again, clearly you don't want that next to your house, uh, you know, so you want to follow uh, the rules as best advised by Cal Fire, but you can do that and still have um, larger shrubs and trees that are simply planted, you know, 20, 30 feet away from your structure. So then uh, to kind of piggyback on that, someone is asking if there are any native plants that serve as a good fire barrier. Oh. Uh. Here's the problem with fire, everything will burn. And, you know, people have 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 tried to make lists of of, uh, of plants that are more fire tolerant, less fire tolerant. Um, when you have the sort of wildfire, uh, for example, you know, the Tubbs fire, when it swept through where it swept through, um, in 2017 um what you had planted was really probably not going to make any difference at all because it was all going to burn because of the heat of the fire and um so i, I there, there's really nothing that you can do to to prevent fire from moving through your landscape it's going to it's going to move through but you want to do the appropriate things. You want to, um, you know, keep the sh the under shrubs pruned so that they don't ladder up to your bigger trees, and so on and so forth. Um, all of those, all of those concepts that Cal Fire describes. All right, thank you. Um, so. Uh, we have someone asking about if you can comment on the watering cycle for native plants. Um, are they, is it similar to the natural uh, California water cycle or are they, do you need to tailor your water, watering more for the garden? Okay. Um, I'm going to attack this in a couple of directions. And I'm also going to go back to that previous question about fire, fire related. Um, you know, many of the species of plants 
particularly native, some native plants which have taken a bad rap um, uh, about being too flammable. Um, if they're in your home garden and they're getting a little bit of supplemental water through the summertime and they are well hydrated, they're gonna be so less likely to, to catch on fire uh, quickly, first of all. Um, many California natives don't want any supplemental water. These are things that you just sort of have to read and learn um, uh, as you go. But all of these plants are going to require watering to get established for the first year or two. Um, I don't plant anything in my garden that doesn't get a hookup to a drip line, at least temporarily. And then once it's established, if it's a, if it's a specimen that does not want supplemental water in the summertime, a good example of that is Ceanothus, California lilac, does not like supplemental water in general. Um, so once that is established in your garden, then you can go back in and, you know, and plug those drip lines so that 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 uh, specimen is no longer getting dripped. All right. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I and I, l l l let me let me just add with that with the watering um, in the front of my house, I have like three drip zones three areas that are on different drip lines so to speak um and they get dripped maybe once every 10 days for 20 minutes so minimal water um and uh as our most recent drought uh, unfolded um from the summer of from calendar year 20 to 21 i think those were the two years i cut my water usage at home my my third of an acre here in half for the year and i did not lose anything in the garden okay. so the, na the those natives will tolerate those periods of drought way better than non-natives is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And um, so for our last question, I know we didn't get to everyone's questions. There are um, a lot of enthusiastic, enthusiastic gardeners out there. Um, we will be sending out an email tomorrow that contains links to how to contact the master gardeners and ask your questions further. So um, don't worry, there's still resources we're gonna connect you with. Uh, but for tonight, uh, our last question I'd like to end with here is someone is saying, what do you suggest for putting a landscape plan together to help guide the creation of a garden for wildlife? Are there designers out there who can help? Um, I think that would probably be a challenge to find a commercial landscaping professional who is fully up to speed um, in using natives, although that is certainly changing over time. Um, one of the thing one of the things I'm curious about, I, I shared that video of the white line sphinx moth. And this year there is such an increase in sightings of them. And I realized that, you know, some of that might be related to, you know, a wetter winter and, 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 and clearly, you know, host plants for them um, to live in. Um, but I wonder if perhaps uh, we're actually, uh, um, our attempts to get people to plant more natives might actually be having a substantive effect. Uh, I don't know that. It's just supposition on my part. Oh, and thank you, Kim Pearson. Yes, that Philadelphus is the species that I have trouble that the deer eat in my front yard. Mm -hmm. um, Philadelphus louisiae. Um, it's 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 my bad deer, uh, but it's finally now tall enough that I think next year they won't be able to reach the top. So we'll see how that goes. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for taking the time to come and uh, share your knowledge with all of us and for letting us record this. Uh, we will be posting it to Sonoma Land Trust YouTube channel tomorrow. We're also following up with an email with um, the attachments. I know some of you weren't able to get them through the chat. And uh, just thanks to everyone for attending tonight, and we hope to see you again. I, I, I was just going to add this, um, Ingrid. Um, if if somebody's really interested and wants to have a more in-depth conversation with me personally, um, this coming Saturday, they can find me at the Farmer's Market um, at the Luther Burbank Center for the Arts here in Santa Rosa. I'll be working the Esther Gardner um, information.